Hey, it's Jim, and this is FRM Part 2, the topic on operational risk and resilience, and the reading on an introduction to operational risk and resilience. I'd like to start with a fictional example. It might take me a few minutes. Uh, bear with me. I think it might be worth it as we go through not just this slide deck, but the next handful of slide decks on, on these future readings. You might recall that I like to ask my students to play roles and I'll ask you to play roles and me to play a role here. So let's start with this. I'm a bank, I'm Jim's bank. And I raise some capital from you guys. You guys are my investors. So some of you are depositors. Uh, let's say that's about $60 worth. Some of you are bondholders. Let's suppose that's maybe $30 worth. And, and the rest of you are shareholders, all right? So pick your group that you want to be in, because uh, we'll refer to that group as we go through the next handful of readings. So what have I done? I've raised $100. And it, of course, it could be $100 million or $100 billion. So the question then becomes, what do I do? What do I do with that capital? Well, central bank is going to make me keep some cash on hand, right? Reserve requirements. So that's 8 or 10 or $12. And then I'm going to have to buy some buildings and some equipment and some software and all sorts of other stuff to uh, make certain that I can operate. You know, let's suppose that that's, uh, you know, another $30, let's say. So, so that's le that leaves me with, what, $40 that I have. No, I didn't do the math right there. That leaves me with $60 that I have available to invest in my performing assets. So let's suppose that I and I, I make some mortgage loans, I make some student loans, I make some car loans, I have credit card debt loans in there, I've got, you know, whatever it is on that left-hand side of the balance sheet. So I want you to think about this. Operational risk is really the management of those assets on the left-hand side of the balance sheet, including all of them, maybe not the reserve requirements, but including the buildings, and how it impacts the income statement, how it impacts the top right of the income statement, you know, revenues, which is price times quantity, right? And how it impacts all of the uh, expenses on the left-hand side of the income statement. And so I want you to think about operational risk as the relationship between those assets, which are funded by the liabilities, right? You three groups of uh, sources of capital and the impact over on the balance, uh, uh, excuse me, over on the income statement. And you'll see a little bit of this in the learning objectives, but then it's going to be really clear when I give you this definition. So what are we going to do in this first introductory reading? We're going to describe operational risk management and its framework. We'll go ahead and talk about the all the work that went on in uh, Basel. We've talked about that in other in other readings as well. Then we'll talk about some characteristics. And then notice the last one is really the second part of this reading, uh, resilience. So let's go ahead and start with the BCBS operational risk definition. Ready? The risk of loss resulting from inadequate internal processes, people, and systems or failed internal processes, people, and systems, or from external events. So break that down in a couple of different levels. We've got the micro level, internal, and we got the macro level, external. But then we need to break it into its layers, right? Processes, people, and systems. So what, let's just take the obvious notion. Um, as a depositor, you guys are giving me some of your information, right? Whatever that is, social security number, uh, over here on the on the left hand side of the balance sheet, those of you who take out mortgage loans, I mean, you have to give me your social security number and your income and your assets. So I have to protect that data. And so think about this operational risk as uh, the risk associated with somebody else gaining access to that data for whatever purposes. So it's important to recall that we're not just talking about failed internal processes, people and systems, but we're talking about inadequate as well. You know, you read in the Wall Street Journal, and I regularly say this, you ought to be reading the Wall Street Journal every day, uh, that we read about failures all the time and they get the headlines. Every once in a while, we'll read about inadequate uh, problems inside of this operational risk. So let's go ahead and look at this first part of the LOS. It asks us to take a look at that operational risk 
definition? And then how about the framework to, well, you guys have heard me say this before. Now, remember, I do this, I say this to my students, and this is kind of Jim's general idea, but I, I learned this from my PhD professors. You know, we want to identify the risk, quantify the risk, and then manage the risk. But what we're doing inside of this reading is we have a couple of different extra layers inside of, uh, of my kind of a framework. So Jim's framework has three, uh, but the reading has uh, a handful more. So what are we going to do? We're going to identify the risks. We're going to assess them. So that's kind of like uh, my, man uh, my quantifying. So we're assessing means, you know, part of that is a mathematical tool. And then part of it is maybe some artistry and judgment involved in, uh, you know, simple, uh, simple, processes uh, that we go through to manage all of these different kinds of inputs into the system. And then we monitor, of course, all organizations that, that uh, run these types of professional exams focus on the monitoring part. You have to have some mechanism in place under which all of the people who are identifying and assessing and controlling and reporting that those individuals and groups of individuals are being monitored. And then, of course, the good supply chain people and operations uh, people, they, they, they love that word control in there. And so that's just kind of like, uh, I always think back to my, I had a quantitative business analysis class, you know, 100 years ago when I was, uh, when I was in college and, uh, you know, quality control. That was like the words that uh, were used back in the 80s when I was in college. But it means so much more now. And then, of course, we're going to report. So, you know, what do you've got? You have these five kinds of pieces that are associated with this operational risk management framework. So let's go ahead and visit about what types of risks that fall inside. Here, let me go back here real quick. That fall inside of this, not really a circle, you know, it's kind of like a sun and there are the planets that are going around it. And so we need system failure. You guys know this as well as I do. You know, in my college, we, we have all sorts of system failure, failures for, you know, scheduling and grading and all those kinds of things. But for a financial institution, uh, this is super important. Think about the depositors on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Think about the, uh, uh, the borrowers on the left-hand side of the balance sheet. So any kind of a system failure. I remember when I had my one of my first mortgages, I don't even know how many mortgages I've had in this particular house we're living in. We've been here 20 years, but it's been sold so many times. Um, uh, but Countrywide had our mortgage for like three or four months. And I got this letter from them saying, uh, by the way, we're not quite sure how much you owe us. I was like, okay, let me keep making my monthly payment. All right, human error, this happens all the time. You don't need me to explain this. Fraud and unethical activity. You know, I tell my students all the time, I try to teach this to my children as well, that, uh, and we talk about this uh, in, in our governance conversations, our governance recordings, good systems of corporate governance, that, you know what, uh, when you have integrity in small things, then you have integrity in big things. You know, that's, you know, kind of a linear conclusion there. And I tell my students, I say, look, sooner or later, you're going to have to make an ethical decision. You're going to have to show integrity. You might as well start right now. And so fraud and unethical activity, of course, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a part of this operational risk management framework, no matter how many times my students listen to me and how many times you guys listen to me. Uh, you know, we've got all of these other uh, organizations outside that are interested in our decision making, like governments and regulatory bodies. So we have these violations and then outsourcing risks. You know, I, I, this is the great example that I teach my students. And we talk about this just a little bit in some of the, our previous uh, discussions uh, that, you know, take example, the uh, a futures exchange where you have where you have a separate contract written with the exchange, you know, it's a, called a clearinghouse, right? The, the clearinghouse in the short position and the clearinghouse and the long position. That means the short and the long position, they don't really ever have to meet each other and they don't have to worry about tracking each other down to exchange gains and losses. And so that outsourcing risk is really just kind of another, uh, another version of, uh, of uh, several different risks combined with credit risk as well. All right, let's take a look at these seven Basel II event risk categories. Um, 
Notice in our two diamond points that we've created there, we have a couple of words highlighted, strengthen the banking system. And for those of you who actually go and look at the readings, I think it's fascinating that this particular reading uh, gives a little bit of a history lesson back to you know the 2008 financial crisis, and the reading suggests something like you know what banks they did a lot of stuff, but they didn't do enough stuff, and so what we're doing here is we're trying to respond to financial crises to make sure that we strengthen not just individual banks but the entire financial system. So notice the last part of that sentence: make it more resilient to shocks. So I'm guessing, I'm guessing that a likely exam question is going to be, here, let me just go back here real quickly. Can I go all the way back to the very beginning? You know, look at the second part of the topic, the last part of this, of this reading title, resilience, resilience. And so where am I here? Uh, make it more resilient to shocks. What we want to do, what we want to do, what the Basel II and the Basel I and the Basel III people, and you know, Basel IV and V and X, is what they're going to want to do is say something like, look, when the next time we have COVID, we just want to yawn because here's this crisis and we're prepared for it. You know, we might take a hit, we might take some losses, or we might have to rearrange, we might have to do something, but we're not going to be able to say, boy, that was a shock. We never saw that coming. Right, so resilient to shocks means that you're aware of this stuff. And then notice the second, uh, the second uh, bolded point. So we have the core elements, right? Uh, seven event risk categories. So they're helping, look, identify and quantify and manage uh, the potential risks. All right, so here we go down the left-hand column. And I'm going to show this to you just really quickly. We've got two slides that look exactly the same, but what the reading does is it emphasizes, look on the far right column, the frequency of these events and the severity of these events. So I'm guessing that you probably wouldn't be responsible for rem remembering that external fraud has 30% frequency and 9% severity, but we've summarized up at the top for you. 75% of the frequency comes from external fraud, the uh, employment practices, and clients and products, and then the execution and delivery. So if you sum those, you get you know somewhere about a third. And if you do the same thing here under severity, well, you would guess that they would have some commonality there. And of course, there is some commonality there. Notice that clients, products, and business practices, that's 52% of the severity of these losses. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna ask you to get your phones out, take a picture of this slide. You can pause, right? I don't have to wait for you. And then go ahead and uh, take a picture of this slide. Not so much to memorize you know, those percentages on the right-hand side, but clearly you'll have to memorize those seven events. I think that's probably pretty easy to remember. And then some examples that are in that middle, uh, in that middle column because I think a really good example is to have a question stem where you're given a scenario. Here's a financial institution that does this and this and this. Uh, what would this be an example of? What type of, a, of an event risk would you most likely categorize this? And then, you know, you, what do you have? You have four choices on your exam. Clearly, they wouldn't give you seven choices, but they would give you four choices. So think about it. You got seven here. Uh, and so this is at least eight or 10 questions that if I were making up an exam, I could make those up really, really easily. So you probably have maybe one or two of those on the exam. All right, you got pictures of those, that's, that's good. Let me revisit that very first slide, and there's the definition again in the red bullet point, inadequate or failed internal processes, people or systems, and external events. Now, this section of the reading, to me, was really kind of fascinating because it suggests something like this. It says, you know what? There was an old definition of operational risk. And the old definition is not that old. It's not like it was back in the 1880s. But the old definition said something like, you know what? We want to include legal risk, but we want to exclude strategic and reputational risk. And so I get it. I, I get it. Let's put, let's put strategies and reputation. Let's put that somewhere else. 
That's okay to categorize it somewhere else. However, there is an obvious link between the strategy developed by the board of directors and the chief risk officer and, and reputations. There has to be some link in there with the operations, what inadequate or failed internal processes, right? I don't need to read that to you again. So there's a short paragraph at the end of this section that says something like, and there it is at the bottom, you know, we'd like you to think that strategic risk and reputational risk is zero. But if it's not zero, then go ahead and consider it. So let me read that to you. Let's just read along together. Where appropriate, strategic and reputational risk should be considered by banks' operational risk management. So to me, that sounds an awful lot like, hey, let's forget about the old definition. Let's go ahead with this new definition. But then the new definition is exactly what it tells us in the bullet point. But then we're going to consider uh, uh, strategic risk and reputational risk. So I'm guessing that this would show up on an exam in some fashion that says something like, okay, ignore strategy and reputation. Then you can just go by the old definition, make sure you add the legal risk in there. And then somewhere along the line, there'll be a question that throws in some kind of a strategy. Maybe the board decides to do something that it probably shouldn't have been done, or it's not an expert in doing, or there's a reputation involved. You know, the, the great example of reputational risk that I know of, and I'm guessing that many of you probably weren't even alive back in 1981 or 1982. It was in my early college years when Tylenol experienced this tremendous damage to his reputation because some individual took the caplets and spilled out the medicine and put some cyanide poisoning in there and seven, seven people died. I mean, this was a tragedy. But Johnson & Johnson, the makers of Tylenol, they, they handled this in, in a tremendous fashion. What they did is they immediately expressed their sorrow and sadness and regret that their product was a participant in this uh, in the deaths, but they weren't responsible for it. What they did, they immediately recalled all of their medicine. It cost them tens of millions of dollars. You know, this is what, 50 years ago or so. And then they decided to put the clear things on top of their bottle. So every time you go and buy something today, you know, there's something protecting you. And that's that's from Johnson & Johnson. So that's a great example. And I'm guessing that you got, you probably know even better examples than I do inside of the financial institutions industry, you know, about the fraud and misappropriation and embezzlement and rogue traders and all this kind of stuff that damages reputation. So my point of all that, you know, the last two or three minutes of my recording here was to be able to make a determination on the exam of when it is appropriate. So where is it appropriate? Strategic and reputational risk should be considered. And so you'll have to decipher a sentence or two in the question stem and you'll have to say, okay, I think this is a problem. Let's go ahead and consider it. That seems to me like the most likely, uh, the most likely outcome, right? So here, here's just a quick slide summarizing what I've been saying. So legal risk, regulatory fines, penalties, all that other, all that stuff. You know about that. Reputational risk, poor decisions or unethical behavior, strategic risk, uh, wrong decisions or failed execution of a given strategy. You know, I always think about my training in corporate finance here. You know, failed execution, wrong decisions, incorrect decisions, inaccurate decisions. These are all just uh, can be summarized by poor capital budgeting decision making. And those of you who read the Wall Street Journal, you'll know that CEOs and CFOs, they're fired all the time because of uh, because of that. All right, let's go back to Jim's uh, steps and the reading steps. And, and you know, so here are four actions, the risk management process. So we're going to identify the risks. So we have to figure out what, what those key risks are. And we assess it. So we do some quantitative stuff. So that's my, uh, that's my uh, quantify the risks. We're going to do this mathematically and we're going to do it with some of our judgment. And then what do we do about it? You know, manage the risk. So my, my risk management is risk mitigation and risk uh, monitoring, you know, mit risk mitigation strategies. I mean, let's suppose that we're a financial institution and we're super worried about a rogue trader losing billions of dollars in the derivatives market. Well, one of the things that we could do is we could just not trade derivative securities. Well, that's one, that's one possibility. However, 
Think about all of the potential profits, not to mention arbitrage opportunities that are possible by trading derivative securities inside of the strategy. So then we have to decide, okay, we're going to take this risk, but how are we going to monitor and reduce those risks with the use of futures contracts or swap contracts or some kind of other, uh, other strategy? Now, this is an interesting part of the reading. Uh, you know, what, what textbooks in general, what academic individuals in general would love to be able to tell their students is, okay, here's a risk and here are the characteristics of the risk. And no matter what happens, these are the characteristics. Well, that's not true under this operational risk exposure. So what do we know? They are heterogeneous, means that they're varied, multifaceted. They come in all different shapes and sizes and distributions. And so this is what I really like about this question here. Heterogeneous means that we don't have to have a normal distribution. You know, let's go back to my Jim's Bank example. Suppose I have, uh, what did I say? I had $60 to lend to mortgage uh, borrowers. You know, suppose that I... I, I I lend $30 to those and I put together a distribution and it's a normal distribution just for some crazy reason. It's a normal distribution and I can look at those uh, losses and gains on that distribution and I can say, all right, I, I can use the central limit theorem. I can use that dude Chebyshev from Russia and I can say, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, and identify what those losses could be under severe conditions and I can do value at risk and I can do expected exposure, all those things that we've talked about. But suppose that it's not a normal distribution. Suppose it's some crazy distribution that we don't even know about. So all the decisions that I've made, you know, are these human errors? Possibly. Are they software errors? Possibly. But so that's a really good question here embedded in, these, in this heterogeneous characteristic because the distribution for mortgage losses is probably not the same as the distribution of automobile losses. Now, you know, for some subsets, it might be. That's why we spend so much time talking about marginal distributions and all those fun things. Now, look at the middle column there. These risks are specific to a firm. And what firms can do then is they can decide on how to manage those. So we use the term idiosyncratic to identify unique or specific circumstances, and we can do all sorts of things. Well, I mentioned avoidance earlier. I mentioned hedging earlier. I didn't say anything about insurance, but we can pick up the phone and call an insurance company or anybody out there and say, you know what? If something bad happens, will you, uh, will you make us whole or will you uh, at least make us partly whole? But the thing about these idiosyncratic risks is that we, we have to manage these risks and we're probably not going to be able to find enough futures contracts or option contracts or insurance companies or other hedging instruments or diversification strategies that are going to be able to totally manage that risk. Now, you've seen me do this before. There are times when we can take, can you guys see my hands here? So this is total variability and outcomes without any hedging. We can have a perfect hedge and we can get that down to zero. And there are some unique examples, but most of the time we're like a vice and we're getting it down to this part right here. And that's what I've been talking about in previous slides, not enough to completely eliminate them. And then let's swing back to what I was saying about those distributions. Oh my gosh, what if we have a big old fat left-hand tail? Operational risk generally has a heavy tail distribution. Wow, so that's important to know. Uh, what does that mean? That means that on the left-hand side of the tail, whether, whether the distribution is normal or not, that, you know, it's difficult to predict those outcomes. It's difficult to predict those probabilities, and it's difficult to predict uh, the results of those things. So, you know, at the bottom, we call those the uh, black swan events, low probability, high impact occurrences. That's why we use things like value at risk and expected exposure. But remember, those tools, those tools are not perfect. So I'm guessing that the inst uh, that on the exam, what you can do is you'll be given a question stem and these will be one of your three answer choices. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? All right, moving on to this concept of operational resilience. So here I am, I'm Jim. I've got some bondholders, I have shareholders, and I have, uh, I have some depositors, I have a bunch of uh, customers over here on the left side. 
What does resilience mean? Operational resilience. It means that no matter what happens to those liabilities, liabilities and equity, no matter what happens to the short-term assets and the long-term assets, whether it's a building or a loan, whatever happens, can I withstand, can I withstand that jolt to my operational system? You guys know I love to give sports analogies. You oftentimes hear the announcers in football games talk about a defense, say, well, they bend, but they don't break, which means they give up a lot of yards. And then when the other team gets down into field goal range, I think we call that the red zone now, then, you know, they put some pressure on the quarterback. Maybe they cause a fumble. Uh, maybe they force a field goal. Maybe they have an interception. Maybe they force some penalties, but, you know, they don't, they don't give up a touchdown. They only give up at the most a field goal. So that's a resilient defense. Doesn't give up touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. Nobody wins the Super Bowl if they give up a touchdown uh, every time. So as you read through these uh, bullet points on operational resilience, just think about, think about a, a football defense, the bending and the not breaking. You know, so look at the second one there, assessing current processes. Yes, football teams do that. Systems, policies, yes, they do that. Build a proactive plan. So they, we say something like, look, if we have some theft somewhere in our system, what's our plan of action? How are we going to implement, implement a strategy? How are we going to monitor this? And like Johnson & Johnson, how quickly are we going to respond? Now, of course, in the Johnson & Johnson case, I think it was about six months since the, the, the time between the seven deaths and when Johnson & Johnson reintroduced Tylenol to the, invest, uh, to the consuming public. Now, of course, in the financial institutions industry, we don't have six months to wait. And, and so we need to cut that down to five months or four or three or two. Better yet, we need to cut it down to a week or maybe a day, right? So what, what does that mean? In order for us to be able to respond, to be resilient, we need to, what's that last one there? Understand the critical operations and identify potential areas of vulnerability. You've heard me say this before. You know, I would never want to be a chief risk officer for a financial institution because I wouldn't have to come to work every day and say something like, OK, you see that over there? If that thing goes bad, we're all out of a job. Uh, how are we going to prevent that thing from happening over there? But remember, that thing, whatever it is over there, sometimes we can prevent it because it's internal, right? That was part of our def definition. But sometimes we can't prevent it because it's external. So we work as hard as we can to prevent those internal weaknesses. And then we identify all of those external weaknesses. And then we do our best to prepare for those external weaknesses. You know, I think the reading does mention... Um, floods and earthquakes and those those kinds of things. And uh, boy, I wouldn't want to have to worry about an earthquake and a flood every day. I mean, if I if I were the chief risk officer in San Francisco, I would wake up every day and I would call the government and I would say, OK, what's the seismic activity a mile below my office or whatever it is every day? That would drive me crazy. But these really, really smart men and women, they're much more adept in terms of personalities than I am to be able to identify and manage all those things. All right, let's look at some practical examples here in our final couple of slides here. All right, so what are these elements of a resilient framework? Continuity of business services, right? We just want to say something like, all right, here's a little bump and then we're going to keep going. You know, so there's an example there about an emergency backup system. I'm fascinated by emergency backup systems, mostly because of my love for television shows and movies. You guys are old enough. You ever watch MASH? MASH, they lose their power and they always have a backup generator on there. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes they have to go over there. So think of, the, I always think of MASH and the backup generator, but my gosh, with financial institutions, you know, we have uh, a host up here in this cloud. Well, if that cloud somehow evaporates, is that the right word? You know, we need to have a backup cloud. We need to have alternate servers. We need to have uh, some type of a system where if we lose this data, then, then we have it over here, et cetera, et cetera. So what is that definition and what is that 
requirement in that second box, strategies and processes for continuity, such as disaster recovery plans, organizational resilience plans, emergency response plan, response plans, data back. All right, so that makes a lot of sense. All right, how about identifying important business services? If they are interrupted, then this would impact consumers, not just our consumers, but lots and lots of other consumers. Uh, I'll give you just a quick personal story, and this is an ATM, so go ahead and listen to me and read quickly that practical example. Um, where I live, I have my bank, and I can go and get cash out of my bank whenever I want to with my little card, but I can also go to a convenience store. And clearly, on the front of the convenience store, it says, here, we have this ATM, we won't charge you a fee no matter what your bank is. So it's, it's a convenience store, right? So I go there and I conveniently do this. But what happens, sometimes I get a $3 charge on my bank statement, and then a week later, they'll reimburse me for that $3 fee. So essentially, it, it, it's a wash. And But I keep thinking, why, why do they do that? And how do they do that? You guys work in the banking industry. You probably have that answer better than I do. And I guess the, the answer is, well, you have to keep track of all your debits and credits. And that, that makes perfect sense. But sometimes when I go to my bank, there'll be a sign there that says ATM temporarily out of order. And so I'm super unhappy about it. But when I go to my convenience store, I have never had a temporarily out of order. So the bank is right there. There's the bank. Doesn't the bank have all the money? How could they not be uh, in business? So uh, important business services, there's a good ATM example. Uh, how about impact uh, tolerance levels, right? Look, look at what we have in, uh, bolded in uh, the practical example, right? Risk weighted assets, required ratio of capital to assets, appropriate liquidity. So what do we know? We know that central banks, they're going to tell us inside of the financial services industry, inside of the banking industry, they're going to say, you know what? You have to have this kind of stuff. You know, maybe it's a ratio, maybe it's the amount of cash, maybe it's something else. And so we need to make certain that we have a trend analysis of all of these risk weighted assets so that when they either bump up or they bump down inside of that range of tolerance levels, we're prepared. And right, if we're going up and up, up like this and we're getting, we're getting to that tolerance level and we're thinking, you know what, if everything goes our way, you know, it'll go back down and, and we'll be fine. But what if on the day where we're this close to hitting that tolerance level, we have, well, let's just take an extreme example. We have COVID all over again, COVID part two. Well, then we bump way, way out of that tolerance level. And that just causes all sorts of extra problems. Yeah, we have to manage disruption, yeah. I look at the example, massive data breach. Those of you who read the Wall Street Journal, you know this all the time. Data breaches and credit card companies and financial institutions and uh, e even corporations, if they, if they lose uh, proprietary data uh, to some hacker out there, boy, this is not good news. So what do we need? Look at what we have in the second box there, a crisis management team just like Johnson & Johnson did back in 1981 or 1982. This team was on top of it, but how can you be on top of it? You can only be on top of it if you do, well, let me go ahead and say it. If you do all of what we've talked about in these last uh, 18 or 20 slides. And then how about uh, lessons learned? What does this mean? That of course, we have experiences where our employees do something or we have some kind of an externality. And then we know about our competitors, right? I mean, we're friends, we're colleagues with the bank down the street. So we have lunch with them and they'll say something like, you know, I can't tell you any of the details, but we had an individual who did this and this and this, and this is how we responded. You know, however that works inside of the camaraderie, inside of the financial institutions industry, lessons learned. And this is one of my least favorite slides. This is one of my least favorite topics, you know, regulation. I'm all in favor of efficient and well thought out regulation. I'm not in favor of over regulation, but that's a personal kind of a thought process. So what do, you, what do we need to learn for the exam? So we need to worry about uh, what the Federal Reserve Board does. And so they new standards in 2020, embedding operational resilience within 
and holistic enterprise management system. All right, so this makes perfect sense. So look down in the purple. What are we going to do? We're going to surveil and we're going to report. I love scenario and sensitivity analysis. I have my students do this all the time. In fact, just the other day in my upper level corporate finance class, we had an Excel spreadsheet. We were doing a capital budgeting project. So they all had their spreadsheets, uh, spreadsheets up on their laptops. And we went in and we changed some of these variables. And then we recomputed net present value. So of course, this is what this is what operational resilience means, putting together a spreadsheet and saying, what happens if we have a flood? What happens if we have a rogue trader? What happens if only a certain segment of our data is, uh, is hacked by somebody over there? All right, scenario analysis, third-party risk management. This is really just a matter of, uh, of due diligence, right? If we, if we ask somebody, a third party, to do something for us, whatever that something is, we need to go investigate and we need to say, hey, tell us all about your business, but then tell us all about yourself. Because remember, we talked about this in previous readings, that, that third-party risk, you have to treat it as if you're hiring that individual or that in organization inside of your own organization. Now, of course, they're not employees, so let's forget about the labor laws, but that's how you manage that third party risk. And then look at the bottom there. We have all these governance, which is the good governance, which is started by the board of directors and then the chief risk officer and then the executive leadership team. And then we've got some fill ins there, business continuity management and information systems management. So that should make perfect sense. So what are we doing here? Governance. We know about that operational risk management, look at that, integrated control environment, continuity, systematically identify, mapping inter interconnections. I, I love this. We, we started doing this at, at our school. I've actually sat on a couple of committees and have done a bunch of mapping work. And so in, in school, we map things like professors and their desire to teach particular classes, student needs, graduation rates. So we do all that mapping. So going back to Jim's bank in my original example you know what kind of stuff can we map we can map all right i got a depositor here is that the same individual that's borrowing money for a house is that is that a bondholder down here too what's the link there and then this particular credit card here where's that link but then then we can link all of the other assets and liabilities and equity, not just on the balance sheet, but we can then map them over to the income statement. Now, I, I'm not giving you that example so that you think like an accountant. I don't want you to think like an accountant. I have an accounting degree and uh, I, I try not to use it as much as possible, but it, it has tremendous value. Third party dependency, look at this robust due diligence. I already talked about that. Incident management, I already talked about that. And then cybersecurity. I mean, this, uh, you guys know this better than I do. This is a huge deal. It's not that big of a deal in the college world, um, although uh, my school has a fairly comprehensive cybersecurity plan. Uh, mostly because we have, we have two or three in, in incredibly impressive cybersecurity uh, professors. So that takes us to the end of these learning objectives. And uh, I think I've given you enough kind of background and potential exam questions for you to be able to be successful. Remember, this is just an introduction reading. So we have a handful on operational risk. So make sure you come back and watch those in the relatively near future. So, hey, thanks for watching. I had fun today and good luck studying.